security technologies. And so uh, the question is basically whether are today's security technologies actually usable enough? This is your opportunity to offer considerable input into the process, but you can offer input towards our esteemed panel of knowledgeable experts on the matter. And so from uh, the far side over, we have uh, Jeff, again from Pixelpin, who spoke this morning, and Andy Barker from Method Compliance, and we have Paul Dowen from Plymouth University, and we have Ram Herkenaidu, who was, until a short while ago, with Kaspersky Lab, but is now operating independently. So, um, I suppose from today's sessions already, We've seen a fair amount of stuff that's referred to issues around usability of security. I guess the whole tenor of part of what Jeff was talking about with the, the pixel pin solution is to try and improve the usability of the authentication experience for, for basically individuals who have to use it on a regular basis. Things that we heard about in terms of the information security breaches survey and the reasons why, for example, people don't update their systems on a regular basis could be down to what they consider to be the usability, the, the overhead of the security in the process. And so I've got a few questions to pose to these folks on that theme. And the idea will be they will give some response. And then really it's over to you to see if there are any thoughts that that sparks. And I've got a few more things I can ask them if the interaction doesn't just keep us going through to coffee. So the first question I'll ask, and I'll ask or let each of the participants offer a view in turn, and then we'll throw it over to the audience, is do you feel that security expects too much of those who are expected to use it? And uh, because he's closest to me, I'm going to ask Ram to start on that one. Uh, yes and no, probably. And it depends on the context. For example, I'm quite glad my bank, and I chose them because of this, that they have two-factor authentication. They, I need to not only put a password on the uh, website but I also have a card reader so for that I am very pleased that they have that on there but for other things like maybe on my phone I just have a very simple kind of um, uh, password well not password but one of the pattern matches which I found out even a six-year-old could just look over my shoulder and actually know what my password my, my uh, my pattern is. You're tracing it in the air now because you've done it a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not very difficult to get into my smartphone, but in my smartphone I don't have anything confidential on there, and plus um, to connect up, I actually use VPN so uh, as well, so you need to have the username and password to get onto certain things. So there's certain things on there even that even if you got my phone, you would not be able to get. So it depends on the context. Paul. I think if I take that particular example, I just wonder whether your, uh, your VPN has saved credentials. No. No, very good. <laughs> Excellent piece of example there. So I think, yes, there is some significant issues in terms of um, <coughs> security and the, the usability and the interactions of the user. Um, I think one of the, the major problems is in terms of the language that's used in some of these tools. So when you think about, for example, the online banking, um, phrases like two-factor authentication are not a user-friendly set of terminology. And trying to explain that to the layperson can be quite difficult. You can give them an example, um, and generally that can be made in a reasonably understandable form, uh, but not necessarily from a security perspective. They may well now know that they are using two-factor authentication, but not why they are using it, how it works, and how effective that actually is. And so when they then look at other systems, they may not recognise that it is more or less appropriate. I think Ram was just, uh, was just saying. Um, and also recognising that um, the, the way in which these things are presented in various tools, applications and systems does indeed differ. So I think uh, we've, we've heard mention today about passwords quite a bit. Um, Steve's done quite a lot of work recently looking at uh, password practice across websites, for example. And the vast variation in terms of the minimum requirements needed on different sites and the different guidance you get from the different websites about what is actually a good password. So a, a relatively simple concept, perhaps, for a user using a piece of secret knowledge is actually made quite significantly difficult when you look at how um, varied the practices across different systems, and particularly across the different websites users may be interacting with. Excellent, yes. So no, I completely agree with what Paul was saying there, basically. I think there's a very delicate balance between how people or how secure passwords are in relation to how difficult it would be for people to use it. 
I mean, uh, Malcolm made a great point in his last presentation about the post it notes on the side of a, uh, a screen, for example, and that was, I actually came across that very situation in a, uh, a council building a few, uh, a few months ago. As I was walking through the IT uh, block to go towards my meeting, I actually noticed there was a chap who had um, a password post it note stuck on the side with his with two passwords on it, actually. Um, I went and had a word with the IT manager and saying, was that his password? He was just like, no, no, it definitely wasn't. It definitely wasn't his password. Um, and then further on, I just had a little kind of question and answer with him, and I just found out that he actually, or that as a council organisation, they requested to change their password, I think it's about eight times a year. Um, because he sees that as a secure practice, obviously keep changing, there's got to be lots of numbers. However, eight times a year and you have multiple passwords for multiple things, people aren't going to remember them. Um, subsequently, that will add that to equating that to sticking that on the side of your screen, you've actually ended up with a more, uh, less secure uh, area. And then ultimately, people can just read that and do with what they please. So that was, I think, overbearing security, actually creating a, a quite, almost a breach situation. Um, but now I mean, apart from that, we agree with what Paul's saying. And Jeff? I suppose I thought generally people come to their computers and they just want to do stuff. Um, and they see security as a barrier, it's stopping them doing something they want to do. Um, and in the same way that we try to design a, a password system so people don't have to think about what it is to create a password, because it just becomes, you know, they're secure by not actually having to apply any, any security knowledge. I think we need to have systems where people don't need to understand necessarily what, what, what the security issues are, but the system looks after them. And I think you get classic cases where you go onto a website and it says there's a bad SSL certificate, do you want to continue? Well, it's quite hard to make a decision on that, isn't it? You have to understand quite a lot about SSL certificates, you know, where the where does weaknesses is. You know, it's an impossible question to ask sort of 99% of the population, and yet browsers quite happily put those things up. So there's like so much um, jargon and perceived, and people shouldn't, I don't think, should have to make those decisions. You know, somebody needs to say, okay, if it's a bad list certificate, you can't go to the website, you know. <laughs> and that's it. And it uh, so I feel that um, we, we just need to find ways of, of providing people with the, with the tools to do their job that means they haven't got to worry about security. Okay, thank you. Folks, does that look like immediately a hand, so please. I found it quite interesting, one of your points actually, that the seemed that the younger generation were less uh, bothered, I suppose, using their terminology, um, about security and the fact of updates of patches. Are we likely to see a change in the way, and we were discussing this, about how data is managed, how personnel, how personal information is considered by the younger generation? I mean, what, so the, I suppose the passwords in the future are they likely to exist? Um, I can start with that because I work a lot with um, um, children of um, school age, maybe from 11 to 16, 17, quite a lot. And one of my worries, because I'm a security professional, is I'm thinking that they don't care about privacy. They don't care <coughs> that other people can see their Facebook or have access to their phones. They don't want any security on their, on their, on their smartphones at all. And, they, and when you tell them about all the possible dangers, about Facebook and other social media, about grooming, about lots of other things, they say yeah, yeah, but it still doesn't register with them so much. And they're living in an age where they're sharing everything always. And I think that from talking to them, they don't really care that if certain information about them gets out. It's, I don't know what other panelists think, but... That's the feeling I get, and I'm worried about that. And I actually create, create some workshops to try and do like hands-on about um, what actually it means to post something on Facebook, um, what the organisation is using those images and other things you post up, what they're using it for. So to try just try and get the awareness. What Malcolm was trying to say to, to, to raise awareness. And if their attitude changes, maybe their behaviour will change. I just, I just wonder if it's if we're struggling to change their attitude and their behaviours, we're going to have to rely more on the technology, such as uh, you know, the, the speaker of the morning mentioned this new method of uh, easy recognition for the password. You know, we're going to have to change the whole way we think about passwords and how 
you think about technical data and technology? Yeah, I, th I, th I think so. Uh, not wholesale, because people will change slowly. Going from what I'm, uh, I keep saying colleagues, but ex-colleague <laughs> David uh, was saying going from doing a password to just fingerprint, and that's quite a big change, quite a big leap, a different way of logging on. And it's going to take some time uh, for, for that to happen. So I, th I think it's going to be a piecemeal process, not just a, uh, a wholesale change. So I think we are seeing that change happening. So you've now got mobile phones, for example, yeah. iPhone 5. Uh, we've got devices now that are common devices. School kids have them. And so they're getting greater exposure to these alternative ways. It's always the cool factor. You know, I can activate my phone with the finger swipe in the same way that Steve, not so many years ago, had one of those flip up phones like the Matrix, if I remember rightly, in the office. Um, yeah, we go through these very phases. Very much part of me, that was. Very much, yeah. <laughs> we go through these phases of technology, and I think, yes, the, the fingerprint example. In a few years' time, you know, certainly they will be more used to providing that, and perhaps that's a generational thing. You know, if you were to introduce that to people of a certain age, there would be a reluctance to use that technology. We've seen that before in surveys and investigations that have been done. There's that that criminal connectivity between fingerprinting and the police, and you know, providing fingerprint samples and concerns about where that's going to reside. Is it in your device? Is it in the operator system? Is it in the cloud? But the younger you know, generation are not thinking about those consequences and perhaps they're going to be more used to those technologies that by the time they are of an age where perhaps they're being used in organisations, they will be much more accepting of them. And I think again it's that issue of them not being aware of the underlying issues of the, the technologies that are being used. It's just a piece of technology, it's just the phone, now it's just the phone with the fingerprint scan. Question there. Is there any, um, any work done on whether these children that are currently not bothered about all of this when they get to where they've got bank accounts and they've got logins into sensitive information where it can have financial consequences whether they change their attitude when they've reached say 19 or something and they have a job and they have money that could go missing if they're not aware because to me it seems that at 15 16 the risk is the social media exposure for pictures and posts to be abused and grooming to happen, which is a different thing to having your bank account cleaned out. So I wonder whether there's, they change their behaviour as they get older, or whether that whole generation is just going to remain like that. I can only speak from my own personal experience. So my own children have grown, grown through to like the early 20s, and it has changed um, as they've got older, and they all have codes on their phone. In fact, my wife doesn't have codes on the phone. <laughs> yeah. um, but so they have gone, and also I find things like Facebook, they're sort of not interested in it at a certain age. It's like uh, when you're young and then it sort of passes it, passes it through and they tend to use more secure ways of passing pictures and things, you know, or being a lot more selective on Instagram. So I, I don't know whether it's a thing, but from, from only from what I've seen personally, there is definitely a, a, a cycle of, <laughs> of these. You know, I mean, I don't think for such as uh, Facebook, for example, or your phone access. I think the younger generation of children, um, school children, for example, won't know the consequences, which harps back again to the awareness side of things. I don't think certain things help that, such as the remember my password functions on sites like these. When it comes back to banking, for example, or when it comes to them having their own accounts, I think that the onus really then does rely on the organisation to make sure that they are going to have to go through that process like that. It would be incredibly ridiculous if a bank was to have a remember my password function on, the, on your internet banking, for example. So I don't think those help. I think, if anything, Facebook can exacerbate the fact that people can be so open with uh, the personal information. Is it the case that, in actual fact, to a certain extent, we should be starting to educate children at a very early age that technology requires a certain amount of security and responsibility, like crossing the road? A green cross code for using a computer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, we are doing that now. So, with the national curriculum being introduced now, computer science coming all the way down to primary school level, um, there is an embodiment of um, safe practice being built into it. So, again, as an institution, we do work with schools. Um, you know, we know that at primary school level, they are now talking about safety online. Very much what we heard earlier about you know, from the grooming perspective.
perspective from the dangers of, of online activity and predation, um, but also recognising that people are going to spend more and more of their lives online, um, interacting with more and more services, and so there is the introduction of concepts of password practice, for example, at an early age, they do introduce it now at schools, for example, internally. So whereas um, a couple of years ago, most school children would be given a very, very simple password to gain access to their online system, whatever that might be, um, we're now seeing slightly more complicated sets of credentials being provided. Still handed out on pieces of paper, uh, but you know, when you're dealing with children of, sort of five, six, seven years old, uh, at least they're thinking a little bit more about it and not just issuing the password one, two, three, four. Do you think well, that, that sort of education will actually now counteract that, that, that under 18 attitude that says, oh, I've got to pull it because you have to bring it in much early? I would hope so, but we are talking about a process that's going to take many years to, to be demonstrable. Um, so, although it's being introduced across the board, you know, from primary school all the way through the years, um, it will be the primary school children who will get the best benefit from it in 10 years' time when they're at the age when they're going to be interacting with Facebook, for example, um, and perhaps introducing themselves to online banking whenever the age limit for that ends up getting dropped. Yeah, I think drilling down again into uh, the education side of things, potentially bringing something into schools and things like that, you've got to look from their shoes. So, I mean, what is going to make them take information security seriously or, or actually recognise information security as a principle, for example? I think one of those things is appealing to their inquisitiveness. I mean, as, as Paul's mentioning, the touchpad on the iPhone 5, people are using that, or iPhone 5 so people are using that because it's cool, it's a gimmick. Um, what they don't actually know, or they probably do know in some kind of sense, is that's actually a very good form of, of security, for example, but they like it and they use it uh, because it's a gimmick and it seems to be cool and it's what they see in the films and everything like that. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be ingrained. Um, I mean, we had, I can remember when I was at school, we had a, a speaker come in from the FBI. Uh, as soon as someone comes in from the FBI, that immediately, because it's something they see in the films, it's something they see on TV, and they deal with cyber terrorism and everything like that. It was instantly perked their attention to these these issues. Um, and so I think it's all about grasping that kind of attention at grassroots level anyway. One more thing as well I'll just say, say is that Try and foster an online common sense, like you were saying about offline, you know, look both ways, crossing the roads. Parents can easily do that. It's about, uh, you know, before you go across the road, look both ways. But online, what kind of advice can they give their kids? Um, they don't have the knowledge of themselves. The kids are more savvy than the adults. So I don't have an answer to that, but um, to really get the message home, we need the parents on board as well. Maybe not to know the whole of the technology, but to know some aspects of it to give some advice or have a communication with their kids about online safety. <coughs> but it's a very difficult thing, I think. Hand up at the back and then towards the front. Yes, uh, uh, the discussion has been focused up to now, I think, on the security of our children, quite rightly. But of course, there is an expanding market, you know, there's a much wider sector, of, uh, particularly with mobile technology. So, for example, in the government now, our manual workers, our street sweepers, are using mobile technology. They're ticking boxes on their smartphone, you know, to say that, that that street is swept. So, it's just, you know, I mean, we're finding that issue of, well, are our security products expecting perhaps too much uh, of their audience? I think, yes, they are, and we do need to adapt, you know, in that sector as well as uh, for children. Anybody got a comment to come back on? I, mean, I think that, you're, you're absolutely right, but I mean, obviously the, the, the products that we've had um, to some extent up until now, and even some of the ones that we, we still have that are targeted end users, um, still assume a level of awareness. I know some do try and present a, um, a less complicated user interface, the non-expert yeah. mode, for example. Um, but even then, it's difficult to find terminology that is understandable by the average layperson. Um, compared to the quote box security expert, and I think there's perhaps some work to be done there. Maybe this is a psychology thing in terms of looking at people's understanding of terminology and also as associating it with the kind of activity that they think they're trying to do. So, for example, the, the security certificates example we had earlier. Um, you know, as technologists, we know what that's all about. Um, but if you talk about a security certificate being invalid. Many users don't even know what the certificate is, let alone that it's invalid and what that means. 
And so perhaps the whole nature of what people are doing, how they're interacting, needs to be looked at properly, not from a technologist perspective, but from a, a psychology, from a, a human factors perspective. Uh, and this is perhaps is pointing at an area of work that needs to be done more widely, that perhaps this isn't just a, a technology issue and how we present things, it's actually about understanding humans better and how they interact with computers. Question there. Um, I saw the results earlier for the um, uh, children and adults for um, updating software. And do you think that potentially a little knowledge can be dangerous? So the, the adults seem to be more inclined to update immediately. What I'm thinking is uh, like a target phishing attack or, or the like. Um, if someone can pull it off quite easily, oh, I must update my software. The adults seem um, they're probably more conformist, where the children are uh, maybe not so much so. Do you, how do you how do you feel that can relate? And maybe only have a minimal knowledge, so someone it could be easy for someone to actually dupe like an adult into actually um, clicking the link they shouldn't do. My feeling is that as if you have an iPhone, it just automatically updates, and you know, not even aware of it. And that should be how the PC should be as well. Because there's no reason, you know, all the security updates should be automatically put onto the system. It shouldn't have to be restarted, etc., etc. So a lot of it just poor design from from years of <laughs> years of. So really, moving the security away from the user to totally idiot-proof everything. Yeah, I don't see why why that shouldn't be the case. I mean, why should we be worried about whether the security update? We want to use the computer. We want it to work. and We want it to be safe. We don't want to make decisions about whether to make security updates on it. Um, Except if you're working for a large organisation and you're <laughs> updating your servers yeah. and things like that, then you do need control over it. You can't, yeah. uh, it's not a one, uh, for example, Firefox automatically updates now, and yeah. lots of other things automatically updates. But if you're an IT administrator and you're looking after certain servers, you don't want those machines to automatically update just in case. Because you will be the bad guy if that server falls and your uh, your customers, your internal customers, uh, complain to you because um, they don't know that you're trying to update and keep it secure. Yeah. So, Except uh, for obviously, yeah, for organisations it's different. Yeah. But for people just in the street. Yeah. Well, I think it will move system. towards that even on the phone. And but the, the David M spoke a little bit about um, like. The, the first smartphone um, virus we had, and those particular ones, it say it basically would come and say, "I want to infect you. Please install me," and then you would press it, and you would be uh, surprised about how many people actually let it infect themselves. So, if you had it completely automated, there is an implication that, uh, sorry, that it's possible that then malware would be able to automatically. Uh, install itself onto your system, whereas now it does need your permission to actually install. And but the problem is there's so many different categories, especially if you're on Android, about permissions and things like that. And it's um, you have to accept it all, otherwise don't use it. And how do you make a decision based on whether it's put mouse exactly. or not? You mean it's beyond? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not gonna, yeah. And you, you may find some of these. Sorry, you might find some of these issues start to disappear a little bit in the future as we're moving more and more towards cloud-based systems and cloud-based software. And you know, one day maybe cloud-based operating systems, and so the device is, is interacting with something that's remote and under some kind of centralised management. Again, it doesn't address the, the business side of things, but for the end user, for the domestic user, maybe in the future they'll be moved towards something more centralised that perhaps will be easier to manage from a security perspective. And just going to your point about the potential to dupe users by sort of playing on their then sort of ingrained desire to keep up to date. I mean, one of the other things that I guess we need to try to ensure as part of the awareness is that they are aware of the the expected and appropriate routes for such things to happen. So it's mentioned, you know, that in an organisation, um, a lot of that will be handled for them. So what you would want them to be aware of is if they get an email like that saying click here to update, that they would sort of pause the whole well. I'm never normally asked to update this system, I've not been asked to do this before, I've never been asked to update via following a link, and it's to, to retain that contextual awareness as well as part of it. So that's yet another sort of challenge in terms of 
educating and informing their behaviour. Now I want to pick up on something that started to get mentioned in the responses here already. So I'll move on to another question here that I've got, which is around the fact that security related actions, security related decisions for us seem to be increasingly required and, in, and required in more and more contexts. We have the, the thing about the app missions and things on mobile devices. It's something that users haven't had to consider before. And whether they're sufficiently well placed to be able to answer those things, whether they're being asked to have too many interactions, and how well also, I'm complicating the question, but how well also the lessons they learn in one context, so let's say the things they've learned from the desktop or laptop, can now transition appropriately to new contexts like smartphones and tablets. So I sort of throw that to the panel to begin with. <laughs> I mean I think it's the lessons can be transferred, you know, and obviously the, the, the general concepts, things like password management, for example, things like updating your, your underlying operating system, the applications running on it, are perfectly transferable concepts. And a user who understands that concept in one platform should be able to transition to another. Um, but it comes back to one of the issues we mentioned about earlier about consistency. So although what you will be familiar with, let's say on your Windows desktop operating system and the Windows update icon flashing up, is not the same um, environment, not the same context as you would have on your tablet device. So your iPad pops up a message saying there's a new iOS version available. And can you find the same information that you would need to find to verify it, if you even knew you could verify it? within that same environment and the apps popping up there, little icons in different places. So it's a, for me it's about looking at that consistency, that when you look across different platforms, whether it's a Linux platform, OS X, moving into Windows, or any other operating system or app, it's having that consistency of both user interface design or iconography, but also terminology, so that you can associate more readily with the, uh, the activities that you're undertaking. Would you, I see that relating back to the um, knowledge um, and awareness, whereas if you you can be quite savvy on one OS, you're going to realise the threats on another operating system. You might never have used a Mac or Linux or Windows before, but you're very savvy on something. It's going to be easy to transfer those skills if you've got that knowledge and awareness. Yeah, it definitely should be. But sometimes there are barriers just in terms of that user interface design and the, the terminology that's being used that you can't work out how to apply it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Question uh, there and then directly behind. In regards to the um, to mobile applications, um, when you go to install a great deal of these, um, a great deal of Android things, at least when I have, they've had, they've, the, they require such vast permissions that are, that are barely ever going to get used. Um, like you know, all your contacts and photographs and that kind of thing. And it's a choice of either accept all of them or simply don't use the application. Do you not feel that erodes good security practice? For me, definitely, yes. Um, I, I, I've actually uninstalled certain applications because the updated ones want access to my contacts, my phone, my everything. I'm like, why do you need this? You don't need all these mm. things. And if I don't accept it, I can't uh, use it. So I've actually just uninstalled them, and and it's not the fact that they can't use it. What they do, they do, they, they profile you. They they will actually collect all that information and maybe use it for targeted advertising because they will know which websites you go to, which bank you use, which everything you use. So it's information that they can actually either use themselves or sell on to others. So you might get in this great free application uh, game or whatever it is. But actually, that's not the point of this application. The point is to get information about you, which is then can sell on to others. That's how Facebook is worth billions of dollars, for example. So, so it's up to you. If, if you as long again, come as quickly to the awareness. If you're aware that this is the kind of things that they're going to get from your uh, from you, and this is the price you're willing to pay, then that's okay. But as long as you're aware that that's the case. But it does make it so complicated, uh, and you can't say yes. You can have access to this, and you can't have access to that. It'd be great if you could. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's interesting there whether the user's even given sufficient information to make an informed decision about it. If it wants access to these things, but doesn't explain the purpose for which the access is requested, in some cases. 
There was a question directly behind. Yeah, um, you, you were talking earlier on about um, tailoring these security interactions and for, for the average um, lay person out there, but surely we need to actually consider the more vulnerable people a lot more. So do, do, do we end up having a two-tiered system where you can, when you first start using software, you can say, well, I have no idea, and therefore I want everything automated, and don't let me do anything that I shouldn't. Um, I know that with Windows updates, you can you can choose to auto automate it or choose not to automate, so there's a certain level there, but on smartphones, um, or, or or, or banking or, or whatever, that there's some things that are just going to be beyond some people. Um, but as society moves on and we have to do everything online, <coughs> how do we cater for these people? My, my view is that that actually isn't the vulnerable, it's the majority. So, you know, I think when we look at um, so like passwords, for example, is it that 95% of people don't really know how to construct good passwords? It's not like, you know, seven, it's, it's the majority of the people don't really understand it. And I think that's one of the problems we have is that most people come to phones and things and say they're like goods, they just expect to switch them on and use them. A neighbour gave me a computer to look at and so having problems with it. She never put any update on it ever. I mean, it's completely updates stacked all over the place. She never, did, never, knew, never knew what it was. And she's a smart person. And she's a lecturer in ARC. In ARC. But, you know, so it's not like she's... She did no one, no concept of the idea of updating it and things like that. And so I think we should think, be thinking that is the majority of the people, and it's only the five percent of people probably in here that really understand. <laughs> Question here. Um, I think part of the problem is when you've got a vast number of passwords, a lot of which are around stuff that you might not overtly care about, that you don't think there's any risk issues with. That dilutes the. Um, understanding of needing that security around the things that, that do need it, like banks and whatever. So younger people, if you've got a hundred different passwords, then when it comes to your bank one, you'll probably end up using the same one as the rubbish one you used on your Hotmail account. So it, how, how, do you, how do you reckon the best way of coming across and getting all of that sort of risk awareness to identify which bits are the high risk to people who don't fully understand that technology? I think actually the mail is the most important one because if you've got somebody's mail, you can reset all the passwords and take control of their lives. Somehow banks and mail need to be the gold standard in security, and I don't know how we how we tell. Them. Well, it's um, it's a responsibility on the server side as well. The the banks, uh, the people who look after your email, for example, they have to have really good security practices. They can't. They shouldn't ex allow you to accept. Uh, uh, to put in like weak passwords and things. I think your research did, was it Amazon once upon a time? Once, once upon a time accepted a one character password and you could save your payment card details. Yeah, so there's <laughs> <laughs> a responsibility for your Amazons and your banks and things like that to actually put certain things in place so you can't have a bad password. And they should have some kind of um, um, helpful guide on how to create good passwords. Or, uh, I, I run a workshop for kids um, and I use um, Plymouth University's uh, password testing thing just to make it like a game for kids and then get them to use a passphrase that they can actually create a secure password for every website, everything that they do and it's unique for everything. And if you have to remember the password, you just remember the passphrase which is easy to do. So there's certain things you can do on both sides. So the companies have a responsibility, and us as people using the systems, we should get a bit more savvy as well. We're trying to make it um, so easy so anybody can use, but there's going to be some um, some learning involved in it as well. I think. Time is flying, actually, folks, and we're now approaching, we're actually on, the coffee break point. So what I'm going to do, just to enable us to round this off and we can carry on discussions outside, is to ask each member of the panel for just briefly to indicate the one thing, the main thing they think could be done to make the situation better. So whether that's 
more clarity of terminology, less performance overhead, more education to support the whole process. So we'll we'll start with Jeff, we'll move across, and that will be that. Well, I'd be very grateful to say that people should put pixel pin on their website. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a completely unbiased response uh, there from Jeff, right? Thank you. <laughs> I think everyone should install matter compliance. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I think it's, it does hark back again to education. I think that is the key thing. Uh, looking at a business perspective now, I mean, if we, if we kind of get the, the wider world, I mean, what you can do is make, you need to centralise everything around information security, whether that's hosted by a cloud or anything like that. I think centralising points where you have your, your end users, maybe your lay people or people who aren't that, in IS Savvy, for example, can find one single point where they can go to find stuff like policy procedures, e learn videos, anything like that. I think that is, is kind of a key foot for business moving towards is to have a one shop stop for, for where they can consult about information security and reference something that would help them in, in everyday organisations. I think if we move further down, we're going to run out of the obvious things to say. So I'm going to move on to uh, consistency. Um, I flagged up earlier. I think there's, there's a big issue there in terms of the, the different platforms people are using, the different applications, operating systems, etc., and having a consistent level of, sort of user interface, presentation of information, and particularly things like the terminology that's being used in, in a, a useful, understandable language. Not finally, right? Uh, I, I think companies need to be better with it using the technology, but not just the technology, but be able to um, make it easier for customers to make good choices. Okay, so signposting stuff forward. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would join me in thanking the panel.